All right, well, I will say good evening to you all, even though it's one o'clock in the afternoon for me. Um, I'm very glad to see you all here. Um, and it's a, a delight to welcome Misty Siemens to give us our program this evening uh, on police records, misconduct records, transparency, um, a whole number of aspects associated with it and associated what we all fondly know as Leobor and have had a number of programs uh, in the past. Um, Misty is the family court supervisor at the Delaware Public Defender's Office. She's also an adjunct professor at Delaware Law School and the Delaware State Bar Association Criminal Defense Law Section Chair. Before becoming a public defender, she worked at the ACLU of Delaware and served as a press secretary for United States Senator Ted Kaufman. So we are delighted to have you here this evening, Misty, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. It is lovely to be here. Um, a shout out to Lynn Kilhorn, who I told Sue is actually, uh, I, well, we're recording, so I'll joke. I was going to make a joke, but I'm going to stop myself from making a joke. Um, <laughs> I want to thank Lynn Kilhorn. Um, for asking me to be here tonight. Um, Lynn has been an absolute wonderful asset to the police reform um, movement. Um, she has been an absolute wonderful fighter and champion um, on court fines and fees. And I hope um, that she would count me as a friend and I am just so honored that she asked me to speak to you all. So thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm going to tell you a little story about Leo Bohr. And then I am happy to have a discussion about it um, and answer any questions that you have. Um, so I will get started. So I'm a public defender here in Delaware. Um, after I graduated from law school in Washington, DC, I uh, worked at the ACLU of Delaware, and then I became a public defender um, in January of 2014. And um, throughout my career, um, one of the things that I hope has served me has been asking why. And one of the questions I had in Delaware was, why do we not have access to police misconduct records? And it really started as a, as a little question, right? I didn't know um, when I first got admitted to Delaware practice that there was something called the Delaware Law Enforcement Officer Bill of Rights. I just saw strange things. I saw um, or heard about um, police officers not telling the truth on the stand under oath. My clients would tell me the same thing over and over and over again about police officers and the names were the same. And one client didn't know the other officer. And so I started thinking about it. Um, and there was another lawyer in my office who was having the same thoughts. Why are we hearing these same stories about these same officers? Why are we hearing about officers not telling the truth under oath? And so the question led us to the law, which is Delaware's Law Enforcement Officer Bill of Rights. Now that predates me, right? Becoming a public defender. Um, the Law Enforcement Officer Bill of Rights, some would argue was a response, um, unfortunately to the civil rights movement. There was a civil rights movement, as you all know, in the 60s, and um, there seemed to be a response to that in the 70s, which included why are there not civil rights for police officers? And that started out as a civil rights argument. And then what it started to become was um, what may some may call super due process for police officers. And what I mean by that is, is that there are certain laws in this country that entitle law enforcement officers to perhaps more due process rights than the average citizen. So that movement started in the 70s and it started in Maryland. They passed the first um, Leobor, Law Enforcement Officer Bill of Rights. And I'll say Leobor just to save time moving forward. Maryland um, had theirs uh, passed in, uh, in the 1970s, and then a bunch of states followed suit, including Delaware. And when I started really thinking about Delaware's Leobor, we went back to the archives and we pulled the recordings as well as the documents from the 80s when Delaware's Leobor passed. 
And what's so fascinating about it is, is that when in, 19, in the 1980s, when Delaware's Leo Boer came to the General Assembly, people had the same questions that we have today. And those questions included, is the fox going to guard the hen house? Um, because what it, the law originally did in the 80s and still does is it allows police officers to investigate and discipline other police officers for police misconduct. Police chiefs cannot be part of it. Um, an external um, organization cannot be part of disciplining or investigating officers. And so that's what Delaware's Leo Board did. Um, but I think the important part for this conversation is that the police misconduct records, the things that came from that investigation were not private. They were not secret under Delaware's Leo Board. And then what happened was Rodney King. Here by a show of hands, who remembers Rodney King? Rodney King, he was beat by police officers in LA. And that was caught on tape. And that was caught on tape, as you all know, by a, an, a video camera, not our phones. And it was absolutely shocking to people that don't have to and don't work in the criminal justice system every single day. And that caught a police officer beating for a very minor reason. Um, and what happened the same year was Delaware passed, but it got vetoed, the confidentiality clause of Delaware's Leo Boer. So in 1991, Rodney King got beat. And then uh, the police here in Delaware wanted a law to make police misconduct records secret. And part of those legislative conversations included um, conversations that, well, yeah, Rodney King happened. Um, and so that's a whole separate thing. Yeah, this law would keep those secret but that's what the officers wanted. And what's so interesting about the legislative history of this bill to make police misconduct records secret is that then Governor Mike Castle, a Republican, um, as well as the, U the Delaware Attorney General, Charlie Oberly, opposed making the police misconduct records secret because there was a concern about them going to the Attorney General's office. How would the Attorney General's office have access to these records if they're secret? and can only be shared in police departments with the officer being investigated. So it took four more years, and then eventually the secrecy clause passed the General Assembly and was not vetoed. It was signed into law by the governor, or at least made law. Um, it wasn't vetoed. Um, however, then the issue became, well, how are lawyers who represent people who have been beaten up by the police going to have access to these? And so a carve out was made in 1996 to allow certain types of cases um, in, on the civil side. So for damages or injuries, not criminal cases, have access to this stuff. So more or less since 1995, police misconduct records have been secret in Delaware. And we are the only state in the country with a law enforcement officer bill of rights that has a secrecy clause. Some states do not allow access to police misconduct records but Delaware has the law, um, Leo Boer, and a secrecy clause in its Leo Boer. Most states allow at least some sort of access to these records. And that's where we find ourselves. Um, the other part of this, right, is civilian oversight. And that's the part of this story that the public um, has shown a lot of interest in for a lot of good reasons. And those reasons are that Civilian oversight is also common practice in most major cities in the country. And we have almost no civilian oversight of the police. Um, I can get into the details of what organizations have some sort of guidance over the police. There are some civilian boards here in Delaware, but they don't have the teeth to be able to do what a lot of the other ones in other states do. And it's important, right? Because the only um, individuals right now inside a police department that are investigating and disciplining officers are police officers. Um, and then if you have made a complaint against the police officers um, for something that's happened to you or a child or a grandchild, you are not entitled to the results of that complaint. What I have heard very recently from a police officer is, we tell you the results and the results are substantiated or unsubstantiated. And that's it. They don't tell you how it was investigated, they don't tell you what they did, and they don't tell you the discipline. I also um, don't know if 
necessarily even substantiated or unsubstantiated is shared with everyone who makes a police complaint. So when one thinks to themselves in Delaware about how many millions of dollars that we spend on our police, how sometimes that is the majority of a budget of a local government, about how the fact that taxpayer dollars are the ones that are paying for the internal investigations of these police officers, how taxpayer dollars are paying for the settlements going to families that have been subjected to police violence. When one thinks about the police dollars that are going to letting someone retire early rather than going through the disciplinary process and getting a pension or getting a retirement payout, even though they're retiring instead of being properly disciplined, I think that this would matter to Delawareans. And a, a fairly recent ACLU poll says that this does matter to Delawareans and they want access to records and they want civilian oversight. Um, I think that you know the thing is, if someone has not been subjected to police misconduct or knows people that have been, it feels like a very foreign idea. And I think that when we read the newspaper piece and parcel and see a story after a story, it may not feel like it's in our backyard. And unfortunately it is. And in Delaware, there have been examples that have reached the paper where a police officer has committed misconduct. And they reach the paper because the officer has been arrested. But those examples have unfortunately included officers that have 10 years of discipline. I'm not making that up. A Wilmington police officer had 10 years of disciplinary problems leading up to the final straw. Uh, DUIs, um, allegedly breaking into someone's home because he was drunk and didn't know it was his home, and getting involved in a DUI um, and saying to the people that, uh, that were witnesses, I'm a cop, please don't do anything. And then the final straw was sharing um, an inappropriate photo with a female officer. There are examples where an officer has 29 use of force uh, reports and then is caught on a mobile vehicle recording stomping on a man's head. That man then gets tried, the police officer gets tried, um, acquitted, and jurisdiction hops to Maryland, where unfortunately that officer was involved in an arrest that led to a young man's death. That man was Anton Black. It was the subject of a uh, Dateline special as well as Anton is now, uh, his name has been memorialized in Anton's Law in Maryland, which overturned its uh, Leobor and are now making police misconduct records public. Um, and so there are examples here of where this is an issue and I can list more of them as well. And I think that um, when, however we think about it or relate to this issue, whether we see the video on Delaware Online or we see the video on social media, or we hear about another example in another place um, where police misconduct occurs, it is something that um, is unfortunately happening here and is happening in secret in large part. And I, what I say to people who may not, I think, necessarily connect to the issue as deeply as me or some of my colleagues do, is what if I told you right now that in Delaware, the law was to have police misconduct to be public. And there was a movement from the FOP, the Fraternal Order of Police and the police chiefs to make the records secret, to make police, police misconduct investigations and discipline secret. I don't think anyone would support that. And so why are we keeping it secret now? And why are we keeping it secret when the majority of states have at least some sort of access to these records and the sky hasn't fallen? Um, and why are we uh, don't have civilian oversight when the majority of large cities have some sort of community oversight and the sky hasn't fallen? Um, so for those reasons, I, you know, I argue that I think that it is time in Delaware to, to make police misconduct records public. Um, to make sure that we have a viable community oversight of our police. Um, and I think that we can do it. And I think that the time is now to do it. Um, so those are, that's what I've been working on just as part of a small part of my work at the Public Defender's Office. Um, I don't know if anyone has you know, any discussion points or questions. Misty, I do. Go ahead, uh, Sally. Last year's Leobor uh, bill seemed to give a civilian review board pretty, pretty um, much authority over decisions. 
And is that the way the civilian review boards work in other states? So there have been a couple of bills. There was a civilian um, oversight bill as part of the police misconduct bill back in May of 2021. And then there was the substitute bill back from March of 2022. Do you know which version um, you're referencing? Was it the one that went like was more progressive back in May of 2021 or the one that had limitations from last year? Golly, I, I don't know. Um, but it was one that seemed to be there seemed to be a possibility of it getting passed. So maybe it was, uh, so. Um, yeah, uh, the one that was from March of 2021 um, would have provided civilian oversight in Delaware, uh, but I do not think that it had respectfully um, meaningfulness. Um, it provided a civilian oversight structure outside of what we currently now know as the Council on Police Training or COPT, but it was housed under the Department of Justice. The members of the Community Oversight Board under the March 2022 version would have had to sign confidentiality and they would not have been able to discipline officers. Um, they could refer discipline to another group. That's my off the top of my head memory of the bill. I think one of the biggest, biggest, biggest problems was how do you have a community oversight group that has to be confidential? Right, thank you. Laura? Hi, Misty. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I can guess where the opposition is. Um, and my understanding is there are quite a number of ex-policemen who serve in the General Assembly, including the Speaker of the House. Um, does that have to change before we can have this kind of reform? Or do you think the Democratic majorities are sufficient to get some legislation enacted. And, and a sort of corollary question, how does the average policeman on, on the beat, I'm sorry, I don't know how else to say it, how does that person feel about Leobor and the, the secrecy that it includes? So I'll, if I can answer your questions by flipping them, um, sure. which is a classic lawyer thing to do. <laughs> um, so the, the, um, the question as to how do the, normal officers on the beat think. The The only reference point I can give you that I can give you as a fact is that the uh, the Pew Center did a survey of police officers um, in 2017. And their survey showed that 72% of police officers did not think that other police officers who were acting poorly were held accountable. So 72% of police officers who thought did not think that other officers acting poorly were being held accountable. Was this uh, Delaware policeman? No, national. National. Um, the political leader, political question, I think that's all up to you um, and what you think about your elected officials. Um, do, you, do you anticipate a bill in this year's General Assembly? I don't know. Okay. Missy State McBride, could to go back to uh, uh, Sally's question, the March 22 bill, the, the one that Senator Lockman was advocating for, what, what did that do on the confidentiality issue, if anything? So my understanding of the March, 20, March 2022 substitute bill is that on this community oversight part, the community oversight would have been housed under the Department of Justice and the members of it could, I believe subpoena, but they couldn't, um, uh, they couldn't, the, the, the findings, what they were reviewing had to be confidential. But so there was no, I mean, if I'm understanding you correctly, in a, in a civil case against a police officer, which has got a considerable hurdle to get over on a motion to dismiss in terms of, uh, I guess what's what's it called the uh, qualified immunity or well people can sue the police department um for misconduct and that uh, qualified immunity in my understanding only applies to that direct person oh okay so in a, in a in a civil suit does the plaintiff get access to the 
if there's an officer that's in or officers who are involved in the matter that gives rise to the suit, can the plaintiff in that case get access to the disciplinary records of the officers involved? So in a civil suit under Delaware law, there is a carve out where if you are suing a police officer or department, so the police officer you know, and their department, right? Not them individually for their individual personal assets. You, if you are suing them for injury or damage, then you are entitled to the personnel records. Um, there's also a carve out from the federal courts where police officers have sued for discrimination, right? Because there are officers who work at police departments where they feel like they've been disciplined differently or promoted, promoted differently or not promoted differently because of their race, ethnicity, gender. And under the plain language reading of the law in Delaware, you're not entitled to that stuff. And so the federal court said, that doesn't sound right to us. We're gonna make a carve out, like just under federal case law, that if you sue for discrimination within a police department, because you've been discriminated more, you've been disciplined more strongly or not promoted or whatever it is, you can get access to other people's records to see if they're being treated differently than you. But that's not under Delaware law either. So those are the two ways I know that you can get it under civil law. How about in a criminal case? If if I'm a, a defendant and I and and I've made a confession, but I'm uh, claiming that I was coerced. Uh, into making the confession, can I get access to the officer's disciplinary records to see if there have been complaints that there was coercion in prior instances? So that's what I call the good old Delaware Catch-22. So in Delaware law, if you are a criminal defendant, a civilian, and you've been charged with a crime, and you or your lawyer want access to the police misconduct records of the police officer who allegedly coerced you, you can file something called a Snowden motion. And a Snowden motion requires the lawyer to make a factual predicate of misconduct to get access to the police misconduct records. And then if you jump over that hurdle, the judge gets to review the records in camera, which means they get to review them by themselves in chambers, right? Um, so here's the problems with that. Number one, it's a catch-22 because how am I going to know that there's a factual pred predicate of misconduct if I don't have access to the misconduct? And the second issue is, is that the judge gets to review it if I've somehow jumped over that hurdle, but the judge doesn't know what my defense is. The judge may not know that I believe that my client was coerced into a confession. And so having an in-camera review, in my opinion, is not sufficient. And then there's more problems than that for the lawyers on the phone who just love lawyer stuff. The other lawyer problem is that I have done a review of the Snowden case law since 1995, when the confidentiality clause became law. And I can find six or seven published opinions where a Snowden motion has been granted. They might have been unpublished and granted, right? But six or seven opinions that say, you know what? We're going to do an in-camera review of this stuff. And that has only happened when the defense lawyer or the prosecution in one case, and I'll say talk about that in a second, where the lawyer was able to establish they retired and nobody knows why, or they were fired. So other than those two ways, um, and I did have an example in a case that was different from that, but it wasn't published, that the judge did an in-camera review. And then there's this other thing, right? If we think back, doo -doo -doo, to the time machine, back to 1991, the attorney general's office opposed the confidentiality clause because on its face, they were worried about whether they would get the records. And what happened in, in 2002, the prosecutor's office um, criminally prosecuted a Wilmington police officer for rape. And in that case, they wanted that officer's misconduct records. And the city of Wilmington moved to quash that request. They said, we're not handing it over to you. And why not? Because of Leo Bohr. And the prosecutor's office had to fight and argue to the court to get those records. Now, I don't have an example from 2002 where I have a published opinion where that's happened again, but 
that has happened in the past because of the concern about the law. Let, let me just go back to my original question. You're describing what the law is now. I, my understanding, but I, I don't know this for sure, and I don't know how, is that the bill that Senator Lockman advanced last year that never came to a vote included some liberalization in terms of access to the disciplinary records. But mm -hmm. do you know if, if it did? It, no, it allowed access, it would have allowed access proactively, prospectively, to serious police misconduct records where the misconduct has been substantiated moving forward. And serious was defined, and they would only be prospective, and it was only substantiated findings. And that would have been public through the FOIA process. Oh, that would have been in the FOIA process. So the public yes. could have not just in, in the litigation itself. Would it have done anything on the litigation front in terms of access, a, a party to litigation for a criminal defendant gaining access? Um, okay, <laughs> sorry, lawyer stuff again. Um, so, um, good question. So, um, in the substitute version, as it was published, there was nothing about lawyers, even the civil lawyers. Um, I believe um, that was an oversight. They meant to include the civilian ranch to get them back their original access. However, um, under Delaware law, um, you, can, you all can play a drinking game every time I say under Delaware law, if you want. Um, <laughs> there, it, Delaware public defenders, um, the courts have said, we don't get to FOIA. We don't have a FOIA right as a state agency. Wow. Uh, I'm sorry, say that, say wow. that again. State agency can't access documents under FOIA. According to two court opinions in Delaware, the Delaware Public Defender's Office cannot use FOIA to get police misconduct records. Okay. That's why we've been fighting for a discovery right like the civil bar has. And the civil bar is fighting for injury or damages. We are respectfully fighting for people's lives. And when you look at um, innocence claims from across the country, se uh, over 70% of, excuse me, over 50% of wrongful convictions involve government misconduct and 35% of wrongful convictions involve police misconduct. And when you look at what some classify, and I know there's some Innocence Delaware people on here, go Innocence Delaware, um, Innocence Delaware and the um, wrongful convictions they've had overturned have involved government misconduct. So I think that a retroactive access to these records could possibly show that there have been problems with how people have been prosecuted. And I think that's also supported by other examples. Does anyone here, have, have you heard about the Central Park Five or now called the Exonerated Five? Yeah. The Exonerated Five, after New York allowed access to these records because they used to be private, when they allowed access to these records, the officers, some of the officers involved in that terrible, terrible arrest of those young men had misconduct leading up to the arrest. Roger. Change the topic just a little bit. Um, police body cams. Who is writing the rules about who gets to see police camera, body cam tapes and footage and all that, because this could marginally, I think, or maybe even partly increase the um, transparency of what's going on out there if the rules are written so that the police actually have to put the camera on and, sub, you know, and submit the videos. Roger, are you my new best friend? <laughs> And are you in my brain? <laughs> so today I actually looked into body worn cameras um, and for a whole separate issue. And um, there's a law right in Delaware that's been recently passed that says body worn cameras shall be worn on police officers. But Roger, would you like to guess who got to write um, the regulations and policies for when they need to be activated and when they can be disseminated? and when they do not need to be activated and any consequence of not activating. How about the president of the police union? Um, 
<laughs> There's a, a certain group established for the law that involves police officers who got to write the thing. I went to at least one of the meetings and got to give my feedback as a member of the public. Um, and some other folks in my office did that too. But the folks that wrote them and finalized them are the police officers. Sally? Could I ask a, a follow-up question about civilian review boards? Um, Misty, in your, in your view, how much authority do you think civilian review boards should have? Should they have decision-making authority or advisory? What do you think? Um, I think that there are a lot of really great advocates doing a lot of great work, um, like Hanif Salam, Cheyenne Miller, um, Hanif is with ACLU, Cheyenne is with uh, the Campaign for Fair Policing, who have a really good point in what they've said, which is that, uh, you know, civilian oversight um, should involve uh, subpoena power and the ability to discipline. And there are examples in other places that support that. Um, there is also, um, respectfully, and I'm just coming here as someone who's read a lot of literature about it, I don't necessarily have a position on it um, within this context is that there's also models where a lot of good work can be done in other, um, in other civilian oversight abilities. Like for instance, collecting records and analyzing them and providing policy points. But I think that the ACLU of Delaware and Network Delaware and Campaign for Fair Policing and NAACP make some excellent, excellent points about why there should be some sort of role in, di in the discipline, right? And um, when we look at the Council on Police Training right now, um, there's, under law, there's only certain ways to decertify an officer. Um, and the folks that are on the Council on Police Training, COPT, I think that uh, looking at that that member body as, all, as well could be a useful exercise. It would be necessary, but not sufficient to get us to where we need to be on civilian oversight. Thank you. Bill Nace, did you have your hand up? Did I... Oh, that pesky unmute button. I mean, sometimes at these things, people wish I could find my mute button. So <laughs> that's the problem and the load that I bear. There have been a couple of recent cases in the newspaper that I have read from a distance. Um, certainly one was the conviction of the police officer for lying about uh, changing the barrel on his gun. Um, and then there were a couple of others that I saw where there was a divergence of opinion or perspective on what happened in an arrest and there were no body camera videos available to substantiate the, the point. And, and you know, that was in like a week's time. Um, and so, it would seem to me that um, in the interests of those police officers who are doing their job well and are faithful to their charge, at some level, all police officers end up tainted by the actions of the fewer uh, that don't play by the rules, that the 72% number, I would actually think it might even be, be higher than that. Um, and so I struggle to understand, and I suppose I would have to ask them directly, the representatives in the General Assembly who are just bound and determined that, that Leobor as written will not change. I, I followed the hearings with the commission that was put together by the uh, previous legislature, uh, went to a number of the sessions. They seem to be making some progress. And then it all just fell apart. And the sense I was left with was that there was stuff happening behind the scenes that had nothing to do with the work of that commission and the, and the hearings that were going on. And I know ultimately it led to the substitute bill that Tizzy Lockman introduced, but the whole exercise seemed 
an exercise in futility, that it almost mm -hmm. didn't have a chance from the beginning. And I, that's troublesome in the sense of the legislature authorizing a task force like that with an intended stated purpose. And it almost seemed that the result was a foregone conclusion. Hmm. Hey, Sue, I, I think that's a little incomplete because the, the bill that Senator Lockman ultimately supported last year never came to a vote because I think it was principally the ACLU came out in opposition to the bill because of a belief that that bill wasn't strong enough and that that bill was worse than no bill at all. So there was some degree of compromise and I really don't know how modest it was. I'm, I'm assuming it was pretty modest, if, but, but there was some movement and it was the advocates for change who blocked that bill from coming to a vote effectively. Uh, Maura, did you have a comment about that? I, that's my memory also that uh, the ACLU felt that if the bill last year had been passed, um, that, that it was inadequate on its face. And if it was passed, the fact that it was passed would keep any future reform from being passed. You know, the argument would be, well, what do you mean? We did something in 2022, what else do you want? So I think the ACLU couldn't support, with SB 149 maybe, couldn't support it because it was inadequate and they were afraid it would stop future reforms. And I, I thought, I thought it, I thought their concern had to do with the, what Misty talked about, the the makeup of the civilian review boards, but I'd have to go back and, and check that. That that that's consistent with my understanding. I thought I think the biggest objection was that the civilian re, re, review boards were grossly inadequate. Um, Meaningless. Yeah. Um and, and I think there was a debate about whether politically that was the right move to make or not. I'm, I'm not sure that the people who made that decision last year would make the same decision this year, but but I don't know. Um, but but there was some movement at least. Um, uh, and, no, and that's there, was, there was some movement. There was no nothing put into effect. So a right. lot of a lot of uh, heat, not a lot of light. I guess. Um, yeah, but it wasn't, it, 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 I mean, it, it, it wasn't completely due to opposition from the anti-reform Oh, groups. no, 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 I understand. I understand. But, but all things being said, that task force that put to, was put together and did an enormous amount of work. The result yeah. was no action. That's all. That's all I'm saying. Uh, Sheridan, you have your hand up. Yes, um, Missy uh, mentioned that the, the, the payment uh, come from the taxpayers. Do you mean that it comes from the taxpayers because we, the taxpayers pay the police and therefore, is that reason? Is that, so, okay, so where should the money come from? Should it come from, uh, how, how do other states pay if they don't, if it doesn't come from the, from the taxpayers, do you have examples of that? I think that my point respectfully goes more to the fact that if taxpayers are paying for discipline proceedings and paying for payouts and paying um, for the consequences of misconduct, the very least we could give them is what happens in those misconduct hearings. Um, so it's not so much a matter that I'm articulating a point of should something else go there, like, you know, qualified immunity or having to have personal insurance or something like that. My point is more that in our internal affairs process right now, Delaware taxpayers are paying a lot of money. And I think that money entitles them to the thing. Misty, do you know if other, if the, are the personnel records and disciplinary records of other state employees accessible by the public, you know? In Delaware? Yeah. 
In Delaware, there is a personnel record exception to FOIA where you cannot get others personnel records. However, there are other ways to find out whether someone has been disciplined. There are boards that make findings public in other professions. And there's other ways where you can um, make a complaint about an individual or an individual and profession um, where those complaints become part of a court record, for instance. Um, but as far as to your direct question, um, there are several exceptions to FOIA and personnel records are one of them. Uh, Sheridan, your hand is still up. Did you have something else you wanted to say or is that an artifact of your previous question? Oh, very good. Roger? Uh, Delaware is a one state that has no ability to have a referendum on anything and have it become law. Uh, California, and I don't know how many other states have this option, legal option, uh, to have action taken, laws passed, by public referendums. Is there any, uh, any anybody in favor of such a, such a thing? We're a small state, and uh, it might be quite an interesting uh, exercise if we were to have that sort of law. Um, but, and I don't know that it might be bipartisan because when you look at the Republicans, they oh, they always talk about populism. And uh, on the other side, the, uh, the left leaning might look at things like Leobor and say, there's no other way of getting something like that out of here except maybe by a public referendum. Is there any stomach for that in any part of the state? Not that I know of. Um, that is not necessarily my wheelhouse. Um, so I don't, I don't know if I can comment on that. I don't know if anyone else has an opinion on the call. I, I think if you look at what's happened in California, you know, it, <laughs> the, at least the referendum process that's available in California has created problems for California. Um, I mean, just for example, and, 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 it, and it can happen from both sides, but Sometimes the referendum aren't very carefully written, and if they pass, it's not clear what they mean and how they interact with other laws and stuff. So it, it it's a it's a difficult process, but that's not to say it it should never exist. I, I, it's just it's it, it it's not a it's not easy. There's problems. Yeah, I, I imagine there is. Yeah, Sandy. I have a question about the the police officer who left Delaware and went to Maryland. Did Maryland have the opportunity to know what the the officer had done in Delaware? Like if he had a, a bad conduct record, did Maryland have any way to find that out? Like if they called for a reference, could they get that information or does the secrecy cover even that? So um, there have been issues with jurisdiction hopping and whether records are shared. My understanding in that particular case is that um, the officer who hired, I believe um, that particular officer from Delaware to work in Maryland did not knew about the records but did not share them. And I think the other thing that I just want to fairly note is that that officer was tried and acquitted in Delaware um, before he was hired in Maryland. And so there were things on the internet about the officer going through that trial. And I also believe references in the online articles about the records existing. And he was still hired in Maryland. So I cannot fairly say that Delaware law prevented that information from being shared in Maryland. Um, but I do know that, at least according to what I've read, um, the records were unknown to certain officials who hired that officer in Maryland because of another Maryland officer's action. Um, and I believe that Maryland officer was also charged. Thank you. Moira. Thank you, Sue. Um, so Misty, someone who felt moved to work on, on these issues 
You mentioned the campaign for fair policing and I think smart justice at ACLU. Are those the best choices? Yes, I think ACLU smart justice and the campaign for fair policing are wonderful ways to get involved if it's something you're interested in. Um, particularly ACLU Smart Justice Campaign is, is actively working on these issues and canvassing on them and also doing a really wonderful thing. They've been having um, town halls with people just at you know places like the Boys and Girls Club where people can come and talk about police reform. Um, I would also recommend that elected officials come to those if possible so that they can hear from people what they're experiencing. Um, and that's that's been, I think, one of the most active groups on this issue. And I, again, I have to give a heads up to Hanif Salam because he has been a fantastic community advocate um, on this issue. I, I think it's the case that if you go on the ACLU of Delaware website, you can sign up to their email distribution list for the Smart Justice campaign. And, and that will tell you things like, you know, when they're gonna have a town hall and so forth. Yes. There's a meeting tomorrow morning that I was planning to attend, and I think it's open to the public. If anybody's interested, email me, and I'll I'll share what I got. Can you put your uh, email in the chat, Dave? No, oh, I don't know how to. Do that. <laughs> All right, you tell me what your email address is. Uh, D McBride at ycst.com. Sue, I'll just email it to you and you can distribute it. Yeah, they all got it. Okay. Dave, what is the meeting tomorrow? What can you say at this point? I, I don't know. This is the first time I've attended. I'm through the um, Delaware Center for Justice. I'm working on a project with the Smart Justice Group with respect to expungement. Of okay. criminal, and uh, I was invited to attend the meeting, but I got the impression that anybody who was interested could attend. But I, I might be wrong about that. I, I don't know. And if I, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Misty. Oh, I think it was Bill had a Bill had his hand up. Yeah, Bill, you're muted, Bill. I think Bill may have to call on his technical support. Uh, Ruth was Ruth was here a few minutes. Oh, there was Bill. Did it on your own. Good job. On my own. Yeah. Dave, I think the the meeting just just having come off of a uh, Smart Justice monthly meeting at four or five o'clock this afternoon. I think the meeting that you've been invited to has to do with expungement and uh, not uh, police reform. But at any rate. The way I understand the status of police reform legislation at this moment is that a, a bill has been written that <clears throat> excludes civilian review boards, excludes uh, many of the big issues but opens up the transparency dilemma. It is a, it's an effort to, to, to get a piece of the pie and to, to try to get that into some sort of uh, legislative process this year, if possible. So the, the, the challenge seemed to me from hearing people report on that this afternoon was that, that the the senators or the sponsors felt that even that language had too much to do with, sounded too much like last year, sounded too much like when we were going for the whole enchilada. And, and so it, it has bounced 
back for some sort of rewriting or rewording to uh, to make it uh, less like last year. And uh, I, 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 I was just wondering if it, if our guest is um, has a view of of what we, what what are the odds of anything happening in in this particular session? Bill, if I had a magic eight ball, I still wouldn't be able to answer that question. I I don't know. I know that what we've asked for. Um, I know what we think is reasonable and fair, uh, but I, I don't know what is going to happen this General Assembly, and I mean that truly, I, I don't know. Um, I can tell you that what our asks would be, um, and from members of the public to ask for of your legislators, if you're so inclined, are the following. Um, we do think that serious police misconduct records should be public. Um, we do um, believe that there should be um, a statutory access right for attorneys. There's one now for civil attorneys. There is an understanding that prosecutors get them, and the only ones that are left out are criminal defense attorneys who represent people who are often, or sometimes at least, I should be fair, um, facing the rest of their lives in prison. Um, we are asking for the release of substantiated and, unsub, um, sub, and unsubstantiated records. And um, unsubstantiated becomes a point uh, with people that I speak to. Why do you want unsubstantiated? It was unsubstantiated. And here's why. Because there's patterns that emerge when you look at unsubstantiated records. And when you look at places that have had major problems with policing like Baltimore, and I, rep I recommend all of you to watch a fantastic show if you're interested in this issue called We Own This City. It's on HBO and it's from the folks that wrote The Wire. Is anyone here a Wire fan? Best, te best television show ever. <laughs> the guy that wrote The Wire wrote We Own the City and it's about the Baltimore Gun Trace Task Force. Um, it's a true story um, and it started from little things um, like unconstitutional practices and then grew into full on corruption, stealing drugs and stealing money. And in that case, there was a federal prosecutor who something just wasn't smelling right. And she started investigating it. And um, the, at least one of the officers on the governor's um, gun task trace force um, had all of these unsubstantiated complaints and like one substantiated complaint. And it's because respectfully, the police officers get to investigate and substantiate it or unsubstantiate the claims. Um, and so in that case, that blew up into an entire criminal prosecution of those particular police officers. And so we believe, especially in looking in other places where unsubstantiated or public, that patterns emerge uh, because it really isn't, in my opinion, all officers. There are some officers who engage in misconduct and I, you know, I think that what the survey showed that I referenced for you is that other officers um, are worried about the officers that are engaging in misconduct and how that can um, relate to a whole parade of problems that um, occur from then on there. And then finally, and this is very important, is retroactive access. I would sing a song because I went to Cab Calloway School of the Arts. I would sing a song to you about how important retroactive access is, but I'm going to um, I'm going to not make you be forced into that because I was not a vocal major at Cab Calloway. I was shockingly a drama major. And so retroactive access is important because I truly believe that there are people currently sitting in prison who have um, been impacted by police misconduct, just like the exonerated five, and we should know about it. Um, and I also worry about prospective access, um, allowing a whole host of things to change moving forward, whereas when they used to be private and everyone thought they were private, things were handled differently. And so retroactive access is very, very important. So those would be our asks. Okay, thank you.
So one of the things that we focus on, the Peace and Justice Work Group at Westminster and Associated Advocacy uh, and Justice Groups elsewhere, is the importance of education about learning things that we didn't know before. Uh, and, and we are very grateful to you, Misty, for being here tonight and sharing this information with us. The proof, however, is in the pudding and in taking action and engaging with groups like Fair Policing Delaware or Smart Justice Delaware, advocating with legislators, voting for people who um, support the views that we think that you think are important. It is almost certainly true that most of us sitting in this conversation tonight are not going to be, uh, not going to find ourselves at the mercy of officer misconduct. We are unlikely to connect with the criminal justice system in a way that that might happen. And yet we know it happens. We read about it every day. And it would seem that justice would call for a degree of transparency and accountability in police in our state and that our voices should be added to a chorus saying, this must change. So I ask each of you to consider that, to think about a role that you might play uh, from active to interested to affecting your vote. Um, change can happen, but only if we work to make it. So thank you very much, Misty, for being here um, and for sharing this with us this evening. And thank I you, will, Sue. I will tell Lynn your joke. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Sue. You said it way better than me, and you should have just done the program because it was oh, so much no. more beautiful than what I had to say. Thank you so much, all to all of you. I also want to thank you because I know, as someone who who has done, um, you know, policy work and and a little bit of community stuff, that your church in particular and this group of people is very, very active on progressive issues and criminal justice issues. And I know some of the names. I remember some of you um, speaking at transparency uh, subcommittee meetings um, when we were doing the police transparency subcommittee meetings. So thank you so much for all of your work. Thank you for having me. Um, and if there's anything I can do to give you more information or have this conversation, please let me know. Um, but thank you so much for your time and your work. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you so much. Have Thank a good you. night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.